Hey everybody, this is Jorge from the Big Band Podcast. Today I'm joined by Martin King again. <laughs> and also we are joined by Ryan Ballo, uh, co-founder of Life Cortex, a more nootropics company. So uh, Ryan, you know, can you tell us a little about what, what Life Cortex is? Yeah, hey Jorge, hey Martin. Sure, Life Cortex is a company that makes a nootropic product. It's uh, primarily focused on cognitive optimization, and uh, it roots from six years or so of uh, history in my life of experimenting with the tropics for, for various reasons. Um, the company makes a product called Cortex. Cortex is the, uh, the kind of conclusion of roughly 1.5 years of R&D to the, to the point of, in, from the start of inception to the point of production of the bottle of, um, of just trying to find, uh, kind of like going into what we're going to talk about, nootropics that are safe, that you can combine together that repair the brain and don't have any side effects. That's essentially the basis for the company. Cool. And, you know, for, for our listeners, the reason we were talking to Ryan today is because last week we, we uh, you know, put out a podcast where we, we, we were kind of arguing about nootropics in terms of, you know, being more towards focus, towards, you know, improving focus, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's part of it. But you know, it doesn't improve you know the the higher level of cognition, which is creativity, and that's where you know we're going to discuss today. Where you know, in, in in terms of Ryan, he responded to that podcast, and you know that's why we're here. So, <laughs> and uh, Martin Martin is also joining us because he was you know part of the last podcast, and you know he has a his own view, view, viewpoints on this. So, uh, you know what? So what? What's um in terms of Martin? Uh, mm-hmm. What what were your questions? You know, le- any questions left from the previous episode? Plenty, I guess. I was going to ask um, Ryan, what what is in Cortex? What is it? It's four main ingredients. The four ingredients are a substance called uridine monophosphate. Uridine monophosphate is a nucleotide which you make in your brain already. It's also found in mother's breast milk. It's also found in baby's formulas. Uh, it's also found in beer. You also make uridine from eating beets. Um, but it, it plays a lot of many roles in the functioning of your brain at the neuronal level, at the neuronal energy level. Um, uh, the other one of the other, other ingredients is a, a compound called CDP choline. Choline is essentially CDP choline is a building block to a neurotransmitter that you already make in your brain. Uh, this just essentially gives you more of it, um, and it, it, it does a few other things. The other ingredient is a is a plant-based compound called artichoke extract. It's essentially just extract from artichokes, which has some very interesting memory and focus, uh, performance enhancement uh, abilities. And then the last uh, chemical is a, is another plant compound called Bacopa monnieri, which is an adaptogen. It basically makes your body deal with stress better. That's the, what the class of adaptogens do. Okay, yeah. Is, is that what you would call a stack? It is, exactly. A stack is no more than uh, a bunch of different, you know, nootropic uh, uh, chemicals or compounds put together in, in one stack, one capsule, one pill. Mm. What, what, I'm, just, I'm just curious, that's why I'm really intrigued that you're on this chat today, because we can find out more about, you know, uh, what all this stuff is about. But um, I, I was looking at an ad yesterday uh, over in the UK here about, um, I can't remember what product it was, painkiller, but it had not just paracetamol, but it had codeine and it had mm. other other things which which were, were there to and uh, oh um, nicotine um, nicotine compounds there to try and um, make the transition of the paracetamol faster into uh, the neuroreceptors for pain relief. But is that, is that the purpose of the of of cortex? Is is you've got some the basic enhancement plus some other things which will improve the, the the transmission of the enhancement or what 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 do all those the four different ingredients do oh well that's a, a few part question the first uh, well first let me address you the first part of your question I'm not really sure I understand what you mean uh, there so so there was a, a supplement in the UK that is supposed to help you to get off a of paracetam is that what you're saying oh, oh no 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 um, sorry I was just trying to use that as an example of uh, okay. a standard a standard painkiller like paracetamol but there were other things in the stack which were there to make paracetamol uh, more easily recept- received in the body. Ah, okay, 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 I get it. I, 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 was, I, was, I was just wondering whether that's the case with Cortex, that there's the, a, a basic um, a basic enhancer plus a few other things which make it uh, more effective, or how it worked? How, yeah. what is- 
In some way, in some way, it's true because, like, one of the things that CDP choline does is enhance uh, dopamine receptor density. So all that really means is sort of a fancy sounding word, but all that really means is that it makes your brain more sensitive, makes your brain more sensitive to uh, higher amounts of dopamine in your brain and or acetylcholine, another one of the neurotransmitters that this affects. And so if you, so essentially, just by doing that, your brain is more sensitive to when one neuron sends dopamine to another neuron, meaning the, the, the receiving neuron will receive, essentially get a greater signal of dopamine, and that'll equal a, a you know, dopamine is largely responsible for being motivated. That'll, that'll equal kind of a motivating effect, whereas another neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, which the chemical CDP choline does this same thing to, it enhances the receptor density, would do the same thing. The brain would be more... Uh, it would put the brain in a place where it's it's more receptive and more responsive to that neurotransmitter acetylcholine in your brain. And that neurotransmitter it makes you focus, allows you to remember things in your brain. You wouldn't be able to function without that neurotransmitter. And so partially the answer to your question is yes, it does enhance natural processes as they exist, uh, but it's also giving your brain more of more of those neurotransmitters as well. The um, I was listening to. Um George's colleague last last week uh, talking about um, when he used modafinil, and um, his brain was was well, was saying the spirit is willing but the flesh was weak. You know, after a while ah. his body gave out. And yeah. I was wondering, the stacks, of course, are, are are quite a fascinating thing where you can you can stack them with different things. Obviously, one thing would be you know to combine so that things for the body as well as the mind. Um, vit maybe vitamins, but um, maybe um, stimulants to keep your, your body going. But now I, I was just, I was just curious. That um, you, you were an ex-soldier, is that right? Yep, United States Army, three and a half years. I got out in 2008, fought in the Iraq War between 06 and 08 for 15 months, and it just wasn't my thing. I mean, I liked fighting in the war. I just didn't really like the politics of the army. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into that. Now, the reason, I, the reason I ask, and I'm not sure if you can answer this sort of question, is I've, that. As I've, I've I've read a little bit about um, the drugs drugs used by so, given to soldiers in wars. Um, uh, I, I was wondering. I'm not sure if you can even say this, but are they? You do, are the, do the soldiers use any cognitive enhancers on duty? Um, no. Nope. They no. Yeah. No. The, the, I. I think that certain soldiers do, and that is probably um, reserved for special classes of soldiers like the United States Army Special Forces, which is like their own kind of elite unit in and of themselves, and perhaps like the Navy SEALs and some of the more elite units. But I was a, a CAV Scout, which is essentially a ground soldier, an infantry soldier. We're just a little more elite. Uh, we're just trained in more sort of tactical uh, stuff than regular infantrymen. And... Um, you know, I, I think though some of us probably could have gotten our hands on cognitive enhancement supplements uh, if we were interested in it. Virtually nobody in my platoon or anybody that I knew in my company or battalion ever thought about nootropics. You know, we we were we were trained to be uh, soldiers by the United States Army, and so and so that was our basis. That that was our we were effective because of that. So we didn't really think about or need that. But yeah, but I think that uh, when you start getting into I mean, we would stay up for three nights straight doing missions, but but like some of those elite forces that I talked about in the beginning do that too, and and they have a lot more control over uh, or say so in what they do. They have a lot more freedom than like the regular army does, and so they could, you know, if if they need to uh, be more optimized for a mission that they're going to be on for two days, then I. I, this is theoretical, I don't know, but they they have the freedom to be able to get their hands on those kind of things and and, and take them. Yeah, I, I was just imagining that. I, you know, if you, you you've you've got a, a special forces raid, you've got to be super sharp. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, you get, it's a uh, universal soldier style or something like that. I don't, uh, but yeah, that, that I suppose comes into. Um, I suppose better get back to the topic here, George. Um, that um, I mean, it, that I, I guess. Um, uh, last week we talked about um, as George brought this into my. I hadn't thought about it beforehand, but the the, the label smart drug. Right. And we talked a bit about. Yeah, so it's obviously. I'm not sure how much marketing came into that. Um, it's obviously a convenient marketing. In fact, talking about soldiers, I, was, I do remember reading uh, Second World War. Um, there was this guy in London that uh, was arrested for selling soldiers drugs, huh. their amphetamine. 
and he was arrested. I can't remember what the charge was. It was something to do with um, trying to debilitate Her Majesty's forces or something. Oh, and wow. he says, far from it. In fact, I was trying to enhance them. You know, it's, uh, but um, the, uh, the, the, the 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 marketing term smart. You know, it's got positive connotations, etc. Mm -hmm. But I, I, my my interest in that was, as George has picked up, was that. It's only one definition of smart. You know, we normally talk about smart as what um, you do at college, the grades you get, the focus. And I see the the um, the kind of ethos around all of this smart drugs is all about um, cognitive. Uh, um, what's it? Cognitive execution, isn't it? Um, I think that's the, the phrase: working memory, focus, attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one type of smartness, isn't it? It, it fits well with um, a kind of general definition of college smartness, doesn't it? And it's no, it's no, um, it's no surprise, is it, how many college students are taking college enhancers? I was just um, writing up a blog today about um, smartwatches. There's a new, there's a controversy in the UK about this new smartwatch. It's a different type of enhancement, sure, which uh, this is kind of like technical electronic enhancement, isn't it? Right. Yep. But, um, but, uh, so that they can put all the facts on their wrist. But of course, there's so many students who just pop in some cognitive enhancers and take up for, to improve their memory, their focus in the exams as well. I suppose the ethics there come in that um, it's if it's secretive, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no problem with when you know people are, are taking enhancers, it's their choice. Mm -hmm. But it's when you've got a competitive platform, when you've got people, it's just like in sport, isn't it? You know, you've, you've, you've got um, people trying to compete at the same level, but others are kind of, this is where the cheating bit comes in. Right. You know? Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it. I think that nootropic users look at it from a very different perspective, and I think this is... The cheating thing and the idea that people have the unfair advantage it comes up a lot in the nootropics community and the smart drug community, but I think that uh, there's one very fundamental thing that people that take smart drugs and have experience, a lot of experience with fussing with different kinds of nootropics understand, and that is that uh, the brain declines as we age. And those of us that understand the neurotransmitter systems that are responsible, one of them is acetylcholine, uh, we get that... Uh, and you know, and that, and and this people should perhaps understand that 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 neurotransmitter just declines rapidly as you age. It declines via stress. It declines just as you age. And one of the reasons you're 35 years old and you remember your functionality in your 20s and you know it's not even comparable, and you know it's far worse now is because you've aged and and these neurotransmitters aren't functioning the way that they did when you were 20 years old. And one of the ways to restore the functionality of neurotransmitters literally is precursors or building blocks to those neurotransmitters. So not that an 18 or 24-year-old would really have any cognitive deficits. Um, so, you know, they're really not, they're really not, uh, they may not be taking smart drugs, in, you know, in the realm of, of trying to improve cognitive uh, decline. Uh, but, you know, there may be a case for students using smart drugs to essentially stave off the decline that's happening Potentially from the lifestyle that they have as college students. I mean, if, you know, drinking alcohol is <laughs> drinking alcohol is uh, uh, you know, it degrades the prefrontal cortex functionality in various ways temporarily. It changes neurotransmitter function, etc. And so there could be uh, there could be a case. It's like you know, college students are getting drunk and taking other drugs or whatever, and then and then like showing up to their tests like without the cognitive capacity to do the tests, and so they might use smart drugs to sort of counter counterbalance that. Not to say that that's right or that's a, a good strategy, um, but it might be the uh, it might be the strategy that they use. But overall, nootropics users, the serious ones that take it very seriously and and come with the same concerns that you you guys have. Um, Look at it from the perspective of trying to stave off decline and trying to repair the brain from the various things that happen not only over the course of like 10 years of aging, but something that may have happened today. If I drank too much coffee or something, or like another example might be like if I was exposed to something, a toxin in the environment that made me feel strange. If I took a, a, 
a Nexium, which is an acid reflux medicine, and it, and it made me feel dizzy. You know, I would have a hypothesis about why that was happening, or if it made my brain not function good, maybe I've got a neurotransmitter imbalance. People that take nootropics understand that they can fix those imbalances rather quickly if they understand which system to target. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of just like offering a, a different perspective uh, on the whole, you know, uh, smart drugs college thing. I've, I have a question about your the, the business model. Um, yep. If, if you just to set up um, selling smart drugs or mm -hmm. any kind of, I'm not sure what it was pharmaceutical anyway. Do you, have you got to have have you got insurance? I mean, what happens if someone takes it, to claim it was your product? Mm -hmm. Have you got insurance cover against that, for example? Yeah, every business should have a, a general liability million dollar policy. Is the uh, is like the, the the minimal minimum effective kind of insurance policy. And I've owned a, a another company, an iOS device services company, for about five years now. And so I'm clued into all how the, all of that works, and all that stuff was set up before I even before this product was even in production. So we're safe there. But the uh, I think that concern is much more applicable in the pharmaceutical world compared to the supplement world. Though the supplement world is not um, is not regulated, it's not really regulated. It's regulated somewhat, but it's not regulated uh, compared to drugs. Um, it's uh, you know the um, all of the ingredients in most supplements are in the generally recognized as safe category. Otherwise, they wouldn't be classified as dietary supplements. The FDA or, or some body of regulation would classify them as something else, like a Schedule 1, 2, or 3, or whatever drug, or something that's that's harmful and you wouldn't be able to consume it. There'd be more regulations on it. So, uh, so there's no doubt in my mind that some people take nootropics and have negative side effects because they are they are changing neurotransmitter function they're changing neurotransmitter receptor functionality in your brain and they're and they're doing a host of other things and so um, so people you know people can get side effects from them I think this is where the nootropics community itself is uh, they understand that and, you know and a lot of people uh, kind of are, are both nootropics users and biohackers in that we induce experimentation on ourselves and if things go wrong that's part of the process and ultimately that leads us to a place where in the end we learn how to reverse those things. We end up learning more because things have gone wrong and we've, you know, we've come to fix them. I've, um, I suppose it's, it's part, part in, in the thing that we're talking about, but my, my mind was kind of wandering a bit. I'm not on, um, I'm not cognitively enhanced at the moment, so I was having trouble. I'm, I, I was, I was wandering, mind wandering, which, which is the opposite side really of, of, of this. But right. uh, right. I'm just thinking, it's a bit like Google Smart Car. Uh, um, you know, they're worried about any kind of um, incident, and there was a little incident last week where it, it, it had an accident, and uh, I was just thinking that. It, but, but the smart drugs thing and the, the supplement thing is all is, is pretty cool until you might get, and it's, it's got the aura, you know, smartness about it. Um, it seems good until you might get someone on cognitive enhancers that then goes commits some crime, mm -hmm. um, abuses or, or something like that, and then the whole press, the whole thing might turn, you know, just like. A, uh, crazy on um, on um, on canvas, or uh, yeah. you know, uh, you know, like the 1940s and 1950s. You know, with those those films they got where where people were going out, you know, crazy with knives and things like that. I'm, I'm just wondering that uh, it was just a thing that popped into my mind as uh, as kind of um, de unfocused the unfocused mind here. Yep. Um, yep. But, um, that yeah, there, there 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 is that risk at some point that it could come point, especially as you start stacking things up, you know, um, and it may just be coincidence. This is the thing. Um, but at the moment, I can see it's pretty. It's got the the because if you the same the same kind of argument would go, but you couldn't do it. So you can do this. You can sell the smart product, natural ingredients, but it's less easy to sell the creative product. Now we come back to what we're. George's interest, I think, um, the the creative ingredient like uh, sunflower mushrooms or like yep. garlic mushrooms yep. or yep. mescaline, you know, uh, 
cannabis hashish you know uh, you would you wouldn't really be, unfortunately you wouldn't be able to get away with selling these uh, right. although last in the UK there's been a number of legal highs in the same kind of classification um, as uh, supplements natural products right so they've started to turn it around a little bit and um, outlaw them until proven um, safe because people are starting to synthesize them too much you yeah know, right. this is the problem they're taking um, the cannabis, for example, and synthesizing the active compounds and selling it in a pure form. Huh. And this is one of the things that's happening, like, what well, could happen, I guess, in the smart drug. But just, I'm just saying that you, you're in two parallel worlds. You've got the smart stuff, which is seen as socially acceptable right. because it makes you smarter. Uh, yeah. Well, it improves your cognitive function, your execution. Right. Um, but the creative side is all has this kind of um, downsides. It seems, you know. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking it's almost they are almost poles apart because the right. cognitive enhancers are all stimulants, mm -hmm. like um, focus, awareness, working memory. Whereas the the creative drugs mm -hmm. are mostly very the opposite: depressants, relaxants, anti um, anxiety. Um, medications and preparations. Um, alcohol, uh, for example, uh, mm -hmm. is, is one of those um, that people take regularly. But um, right. so, have you have you thought of offering all sides to cognitive enhancement, um, the smart side and the creative side, for example? Is there any? Would you? <laughs> it wouldn't look good with it. You, uh, but it would work, I suppose. You know, you could take a, it's like an apples and a downers, isn't it? You could you could take uh, you could take your your uh, cortex, and then afterwards, you know, to unwind, um, here's a bottle of Captain whatever. You know. Yeah. Uh, is that yeah. something you've thought about at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've definitely thought about it, and people do things like that. Well, you know, alcohol and you know impairs brain function, and so people would uh, kind of, in a similar fashion, drink some alcohol, realize they have impaired brain function, then take a nootropic to get their verbal fluency back or something if they need to have a conversation with somebody. And so that's something that people do, and that's something I've certainly thought about. But to to go back to like the first part of your question, whether or not people are going to start taking smart drugs and event and then just freak out and start hurting people or, or, or it's going to make you know, it's going to put them in a place where they're overstimulated and, and they may commit a crime. I think that we have enough time of people using smart drugs. It's just becoming popular now, but I mean for 15 plus years there's been an underground kind of uh, contingent of people that have been using them and largely we just don't see this stuff happening and I, I think one of the reasons are is because most smart drugs, whether you're talking about something like Cortex, which is a, a nootropic, it's not actually considered a drug, uh, or you're talking about some of the actual smart drugs like aniracetam, uh, they, they, they improve your capacity to sort of logic through life. And so one, one doesn't really, I just don't foresee one losing their, their rationale for behaving normally uh, using something that makes them smarter or, or that uh, temporarily makes the mechanisms of the brain that are responsible for them being smart more 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 enhanced right? so in other words you know people people I just don't see people taking smart drugs uh, improving their capacity to logic through situations and then as a result of that improved focused or stimulatory nature uh, or memory enhancement them wanting to go and commit a crime like you never find a guy in the bar who's had one too many cortexes <laughs> you know and he wants well, no, it's really, that's something has popped into my mind again uh, on the, 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 the unfocused brain I suppose I keep bringing it in just to wind you up perhaps I don't know but um, I, you know, I was just thinking of a, a, a kind of story or a, a film you know because what, what we've got here is at, you, you said it, in fact, you, the, the nootropics community has been fairly focused, if you like, you know, it's, it's the, the, the leading edge, the initiatives, um, the um, innovators and experimenters. It's the diffusion of technology uh, in society kind of curve. And it, it, it could cross the what we call the Rogers chasm. You know this, um, you probably do, don't you, George? Um, the Rogers Moore... Diffusion of technology yeah. and the chasm, yeah. The, I think that's where we may be approaching the chasm um, with smart drugs. That up to now it's been 
in the yeah. safe community of people that are, Very like you say, uh, Ryan, you say they take their self-awareness, um, they hypothesize about the problems and control it. But as it reaches across to the more general community, you may then get people, one, you get, you get a wider sample of the drugs to um, investigate the effects on, but you also get the rest of humanity, including the psychopaths, you know, the manics, <laughs> and the rest of it. So, um, and so, you know, I want enhancer. If you've got somebody who's got a very violent streak, maybe taking a cognitive enhancer, I've no idea. May then focus their. Vi it's only. A, it's only a. I might call it a creative right. diversion. Of that. I just fear that in the future we may get stories like the Google car crashing. We may get stories like the smart drug. Um, maniac. Um, yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's a legitimate concern, and uh, there probably are some people for whom taking smart drugs or anything that's going to enhance, as you put it, their current state. Uh, you know, whether that's their state is like a state of of, of being psychotic. Um, you know, and that's not a good thing for for them. You know, it's essentially like. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, is that's the case for everything. That's the case for every substance. You know, there's going to be people that OD on coffee and become jerks to their business, to their uh, like coworkers, and start a fight with them. There's going to be people that, I mean, one of the biggest problems we all know, it's a very obvious thing, is uh, that uh, people drink alcohol and become violent. And and when they do, the the it, it, you know the capacity for them to be to cause problems and to do illegal things and to hurt other people is just endless. And so. Um, you know uh, the rationale for the rationale for uh, outlawing alcohol is probably there, considering that, but it's not outlawed, right? And so, and so, I think, um, I think, uh, I, I think it's just you know kind of one way to look at it. But so you know, we can't really take smart drugs and say uh, people are are people that already have like these problems of being psychotic or or wanting to inflict harm on other people. We need to watch out for them, um, you know, in the realm of taking smart drugs. We can't say that until we take alcohol off the market because they have the capacity to get alcohol. All they have to be is 21 years of age. And so the moment you know we can't, uh, if we take alcohol off the market, then we can start thinking about these kind of things. But we're just, I don't think you know the United States. I don't think over there in the UK is going to do that. Um, and so asking that question is a legit concern, I think, but that applies to basically everything across the board that is uh, psychostimulatory or psychoactive, um, you know, or in any way affects the brain. I wonder if, yeah, I wonder if the rise of smart drugs would uh, affect the situation with what you might want to call creative drugs, recreational drugs, for example, because you see... Um, I'm, I'm not that familiar with it, but in, in America you've got states starting to decriminalize cannabis, haven't you, I think? Uh, I'm yep. not sure it's cannabis well. or so. Um, which is the same kind of argument you've got there about prohibition, isn't it? You know, because alcohol affects some people in you know, some ways, you know, some people are chill out, other people become aggressive. But prohibiting it, criminalizing it, just drives it underground. Makes it worse. So I, I completely see, you know, I, thinking aloud here, you know, I completely see, you know, why having um, the, the smart drugs on a kind of open, decriminalized um, uh, arrangement is far better than having it kind of some dirty little secret that right. people are dealing on street corners. And <laughs> you know, can you imagine that? You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure I've seen. Uh, Films, yeah, there are films. I can't remember any any particular, but where where people are taking uh, various cognitive enhancement pills in science fiction films, uh, dealt underground and having all sorts of uh, dreadful effects. They weren't cognitive enhancers again in um, Serenity. Uh, they, were, they were kind of different drugs, but you know the um, Firefly Serenity. I don't know if you know that series in the film, but uh, you know, no, it, I don't it, think so. I haven't seen it. Oh, that's cool. It's one of my favorite. Favorite uh, favorite films that Serenity. Anyway, George, uh, of you. Sorry. Yeah, Ryan. I was I was going to ask you. So, yeah. in, in, from your point of view, in terms of the the new topics, it's it's basically treating it treating it as like uh, like a vitamin supplement. Is that how the community looks at it? Like I, I take my vitamins daily. Right. And it's kind of, it's kind of like just a, like a habit, right? That we have since we were kids because our, our our you know our parents you know put that into it. 
Yep. Uh, so is that how you look? Is how you know it works in, from from your point of view? Partially, I think that uh, yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at a taking like a calcium or magnesium supplement, you're looking to supplement the quantity of magnesium in your or the absorption of magnesium in your body and or calcium, and so that makes sense. And so with nootropics, I think it just seems so fringe because people don't quite understand the the translation. The translation when it comes to nootropics is they, they would take something like uh, there's a there's a, neuro, uh, a nootropic called alpha GPC, which does similar to what CDP choline, one of the ingredients in Cortex does, which is create the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So essentially, the answer to your question is yes. People do look at it that way um, you know, at some level. Um, but I think we, we have to ask the question, why are, are you taking magnesium to get more levels of magnesium or just to meet your, your daily recommended intake for magnesium? And then looking at nootropics, are you taking nootropics to get the, the baseline level of the brain chemicals that they make, or are you trying to optimize them? And for a lot of nootropics users, it's about doing both. It's about getting to a baseline of the chemicals that these things make, so your sort of recommended daily intake, of, uh, your recommended kind of functional amount of that neurotransmitter, and it's to create a surplus of those chemicals specifically for cognitive tasks, you know, for entrepreneurs that need to, that build, that, are, that, that own two companies or are building two companies or need to do a lot of work for the, uh, for an executive that's the uh, CMO of a Fortune 500 company and has got like work stacking up on his desk like as we speak right now. The output, the, the output uh, necessity for those people is much higher and so, uh, so the answer to your question is yes, but I think people are also in the realm of uh, optimizing from baseline to tackle bigger work tasks. Okay. And now, if I were to, you know, get your product Cortex, what is your recommendation? You know, how would I take it? Is it a personal decision, or is it more like there's a way to to use it? Yeah, generally we recommend taking two two capsules as one dose. The the serving size is two capsules. There's uh, 30 capsules in a container, but uh, it. Since it really depends on your brain, uh, you would have to, just like as you suggested, you would kind of have to kind of dial that in. So maybe one will work for you. I mean, I know a girl who works for a media company here in PA, and she only takes one of them. And taking one of them puts her right at a place where she can focus for on the myriad of tasks that she has to get done during the day working as a, you know, a media person in this company. And so you have to kind of see for yourself uh, what the dose that works for you is and see how it affects you. If you, if you find your place if you find yourself in a place where you feel normal um, but a little bit optimized, maybe stay there. If you want, you know, if you want to continue experimenting with it and, and put yourself in a place where you actually do see that capacity of mental functionality that is superior than your baseline and that intrigues you, then, you know, take the regular dose, which is, which is two capsules. Uh, but I think that uh, you really don't, you're really not going to know unless you really dive in. There's a lot of theory and kind of uh, frameworks about nootropics that one can create and people like to create before they take them, but ultimately it's when you take them and when you sit there and like you're like, wow, I just had a, a conversation with someone over the phone and rather than having to sit there remembering the word that I was trying to convey to them, it was just right there, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that is, uh, that will take you to a point where you're, you're, you're you're convinced that they're working for you, and at least, at least uh, past the point of uh, the skeptical uh, precaution and into a place where I'm like, hey, I'm here now, I think this is interesting, and now it requires further experimentation. Mm -hmm. I, um, I haven't seen any, any evidence that they do any permanent or um, change. They, all did, they always seem to be temporary, so you have to you, you take it, it doesn't have any permanent change in your brain, does it? Um, Some it of them. It <laughs> Uh, depends on depends on really the the supplement or the the nootropics. Some of them do in fact make changes on your brain for the long term. Uh, that yeah. uh, and some of them may not be beneficial, and but most of them are. It really depends on the chemical. Modafinil, like you mentioned earlier, is very uh, modafinil is an anti narcolepsy drug. So it's essentially created to help you stay awake. Its mechanisms, like the scientific mechanism of action, is poorly understood. It's understood to some capacity, but there's still a lot that we kind of really don't know. So uh, there may be changes that are taking place there that are not good over the long term. I don't know. I, on the converse side, I've also seen people like there's a well-known biohacker named Dave Asprey, 
who has been taking modafinil for like eight, eight or nine years or something and, and swears that it made his brain work better. Uh, chemicals like the chemicals in Cortex and the chemicals in uh, various other nootropic stacks, like there's one called Alpha Brain out there, another one, um, uh, they will make, I mean, like I said before, if, if a chemical makes a change in the receptor density, that is the, uh, the ability for a receptor on a neuron to, uh, uh, to intake a, a signal from another neuron better, and, and be more receptive to that signal, if that's taking place with a lot of these nootropics, which it is the case for a lot of them, then long-term changes in the brain in a beneficial way are, 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 are definitely happening. Whether or not that reverses in six months is, is really still a question. I couldn't help, um, this isn't a question, or it's just a, sort of a crazy divergent thought that when you mentioned two capsules, I could imagine junkies, as it were. I mean, I don't know if you, you... You may get... Anyway, I'll come on to But you can imagine cracking them open and snorting them, uh, <laughs> catching them. <laughs> I don't know. But does, it, does anybody ever go to extremes to, to what you might call mainline uh, <laughs> nootropics or uh, things like that? Or, or, just, or is it a faster effect if you were to snort it? Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak on the efficacy of snorting nootropic and whether or not it'd be a better effect. I, um, <laughs> I guess the, this kind of comes to like the, the responsibility piece we talked about with alcohol or we kind of mentioned on with alcohol. It's like if, if you know, it's, really, it's really in the person's hands that's experimenting with uh, you know, a given uh, compound what they're going to do with it. You know, I, w nobody in the nootropics community really suggests uh, breaking open a capsule and snorting it. Um, and uh, <laughs> You know, um, no, nobody really suggests that, um, and so I would kind of be doing the world a disservice if I was like, hey, you know, maybe, maybe you would, uh, it would uptake in your brain faster, because maybe it would, but, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's not a good idea. Yeah, I also just imagine these guys in the city or something, or in um, well, Wall Street, in your case. Yeah, oh, yeah. And you're right. Cutting it in with some cocaine, for example, and uh, go going in and trading, uh, trying to keep up with the uh, the robots on the on Wall Street and on trying to take on the machines. Yeah, I mean Probably maybe <laughs> nano trading. <laughs> there you go. I mean maybe 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 people do that, and, and maybe uh, you know they they again it, it takes a, a pretty extreme type of person to engage in that type of behavior. So you know again we're looking at the extreme extremeness of the person compared to the uh, capacity for someone to abuse a substance. Yeah, of course, yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty neutral, it's, it's in it's the way it's uh, But you're right though, yeah, you're right though in that there, there, there is that concern. I mean, all, all your concerns are legit in that there are going to be people who probably do that. And, you know, for those people, uh, I don't know what what anyone can really think of them except for to try. I, mean, I don't know. Let's help. Let's help them to to not do that. I mean, you know, you don't you don't need to you don't need to snort it to get the effect. You know, I don't know. Hey Ryan, so so what motivated you to start a nootropics company? Well, I've been uh, meditating for about six years, and when I meditate, I I always leave the experience feeling. Um, awake and my, my brain always feels a lot more aware and this is kind of like Martin where your point comes into play where um, you know where nootropics are essentially focus based and other compounds or meditation might be intrinsic uh, creativity based and so the, the basis for the neuroscience behind meditation was fascinating to me in the beginning, because when I met, I, the first two weeks I meditated, I spent like 45 minutes a day just sitting there meditating. And then in the subsequent weeks and throughout that time, I just noticed my brain working differently. So I was like, what is the basis of this? And, and, and nobody was really talking about this at the time. This was like six years ago in 2010 or whatever. And so, uh, and so I essentially took six months to read as many books as I could about the neuroscience behind meditation and good brain performance in the bookstore, and that was like the that was that exactly was the catalyst for me to start getting into brain science and performance optimization. I realized that as an entrepreneur, because shortly after I started companies, started to start companies, that like the difference between my productivity one day versus the other, and my ability to deal with stress, 
literally was uh, affected by a 10-minute meditation session in the morning. So th th that, was, that was the beginning of it. Essentially, it was two weeks of meditation that changed my brain in a way where I was like, okay, there's something going on here. And cognitive optimization uh, in the form of nootropics is another route to reach the optimization that I got via meditation. Awesome. Well, that's interesting. Uh, you know, in my case, um, I've never taken any, you know, as I mentioned in the previous episode, I've never taken any type of enhancement. It's more like I try to put myself in the in natural state of flow. Um, so, so, you know, for, for people like me who are more inclined to you know, put ourselves in a position of risk when it's... <laughs> When when we it's, it's when we feel the flow, <laughs> or when we you know naturally get get our, get ourselves into that point, you know what would happen if I would take you know what what do you think would happen to me if I would take uh, you know start taking the tropics? It depends. It, it, going into flow is sometimes hard to induce based on the state of your neurotransmitters at the time. So you might find like trying to induce flow is sometimes impossible. For those times, nootropics would help you to get into flow. And the reason you can't get into flow is because you've got too much of one neurotransmitter affecting another one, and that other one can't do its job in allowing you to enter flow. And so um, that's one of the reasons why people can't, uh, that's one of the reasons why flow is sort of not just a, a state you can induce just by the snap of your fingers. Uh, but for somebody like you who likes to naturally get into a flow state, I think that you would find with taking some of the good nootropics that uh, it will optimize your capacity to get in that state a lot quicker. And then your natural ability to stay in that state after will actually be improved. For example, one of my good friends who was a beta tester for the Cortex stack uh, tells me all the time that it makes him meditate better. And that's because meditation is, uh, uh, depending on how you do it, it's a focus task. It's either, it's either, uh, um, it's either it's just, like, just like letting your brain wander around and not judging it, or it's focusing on your breathing or it's just trying to engage in the act of focus on nothing but just trying to do focus in your brain and so you would find you would find that you would probably find that medit uh, that nootropics would help you to get into the flow state uh, you know while you're using them and probably put you in a place where you where it's easier for you to get into a flow state after I think that's um, it's an interesting interesting part about the flow. I mean I'm, I'm quite different in a way. I go with the way my body is at the time rather than trying to induce it into any particular state. Um, yeah, yeah. So if, if I'm feeling flowy, <laughs> creative, I'll, I'll go with that and try. If I'm if I'm not feeling... Uh, so I, I, I kind of go with, with what I've got. But, um, what you were talking about, there's this kind of, kind of continuum and diversity. You know, there's a continuum all the way from um, natural states and, um, and and controlling them and your inner life and your mindfulness through to what people would like to choose from natural ingredients, natural behaviors, through to um, more uh, pharmacological methods. I mean, it's just a continuum, a diversity. It's all. It's all. I I, I find it. It's quite fascinating. What what um, George was saying about there about. Uh, I think actually what you were reminding me about there was. Lack of di um, distraction, the focus, and maybe in in fact instead of increasing focus, it's almost the opposite that you're reducing distraction because um, there's um, sensory deprivation. George uh, is a kind of uh, people go for that. In fact, don't they? Or there was a trend in London probably about six years ago, where <laughs> busy executives would take themselves into a uh, sensory deprivation tanks and float for about half an hour in the complete darkness in body temperature water and achieve these meditative states, really, you know, using technology, using the environment to do it. No, it was just another... another. But some people have said that, um, Ryan, that uh, the these... Nootropics, they one approach, one theory, in a sense, how they work. Because it's like you say, nobody knows how they work. Is that they do it exactly that? They, 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 they. Rather than increase focus, they reduce the barriers and the distractions that allow you to focus. Um, some work like the creative drugs. They work by reducing anxiety, and therefore let you feel more comfortable taking risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, or uh, 
on on the creative side, what I prefer it depends though is in, instead of um, the sensory deprivation, which has its function, which allows you to look at the inner self. I quite like um, the distraction. I find that uh, it's quite good for creativity. So the opposite almost to the um, to the focus and the um, what was it like? the ex executive function? I keep saying cognitive execution. Exec right. Executive yeah. function yeah. Uh, is 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 what they hate at school. Uh, is oh, stop looking out the window. <laughs> you right. know, yeah. You're drifting off. You know. Of um, course. And I'm doing that. I, I don't know. This is a fascinating thing. You've got a mirror on the back wall. Right. And I, what's that? Yeah, yeah. And then you get the back view of you, which yeah. is really right. cool. Yeah. Um, Glad I haven't got one because you see my bull patch here. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good for you. Good thing you don't have one. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I, I, I digress. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I'm with you there. The uh, the float tank phenomenon seems very interesting. I, I would imagine that the state that you might get in is similar to meditation. And I agree with, uh, I agree with the notion that uh, some nootropics might be just kind of calming down the background noise so that you can focus. Uh, but, I, but I think that there's... Well, having... You know, having created a nootropic and been in the, the area for years, I also know it, it's, it's the other thing, too. They also work specifically in a way that makes the brain uh, function better um, in the areas of focus. You're actually adding to focus and you're, you're eliminating distractions. Um, some, uh, some aniracetam is a smart drug. This is one smart drug called aniracetam. And that is slightly different compared to, like, other focused nootropics in that Aniracetam uh, is kind of anxiolytic, which is uh, kind of like the notion that you suggested that you just talked about where you take uh, the anxiety away and then a person can be more forthcoming. And, um, and so that, that's an example of, of, a, you know, of a smart drug that is able to induce a, uh, a creative state. A lot of users report creativity coming from taking aniracetam and the ability to sort of multitask, focus on a bunch of whole things at once and, and put them all together um, and, uh, and kind of shift perspectives, get on a 5,000 foot view on something and just kind of have that ability to, uh, to move around more uh, f you know, with freedom in their brains as a result of taking the aniracetam because they've calmed down some of the the extra fires that may be uh, you know burning in their brains and so um, so yeah and so to your your initial point in the bank you know, which is the basis for our initial conversation which led to this podcast uh, a lot of nootropics a lot of nootropics don't really uh, facilitate your capacity to to be creative unless you use them to be creative unless the, unless you would use them to meditate better unless you would use them to you know, sit in a room for uh, like an hour in the dark and, and not think of anything, but use your capacity to focus uh, in focusing on nothing so that you can sort of get into that good state. And so, uh, and so yeah, I mean, there, there's points for both arguments there. I think, I think the, you know, the, on your point of being in a state of wanting to be creative, because I, I think that's one of, one of my, my, you know, where my, you know, my skepticism comes from. Which is, you know, it's like a magic pill. You just pop it in and, you know, it's like I turn into a fucking wizard. Right. <laughs> and then, right. you know, it's zippity boppity poo and, you know, you start turning everything into, you know, nice looking things. But, you know, you have to be in that state. And, you know, my, my when I was saying that I like to put myself in the flow state. Yeah. Is because that, that's when you, you know, you're both focused, but also in the, in the, in the, in the moment. Yep. <laughs> Which is very hard to, to pull off in any, any kind of, situation for most people right and you know that's you know my base on my work is, is based on putting people in that state naturally so they can you know enhance themselves and feel like god damn you know I have the superpower yeah yeah <laughs> I don't need any fucking drugs right right and but I'm not opposed to using you know you know any type of drug to or enhancement to you know get yourself into that situation and mm -hmm. then you, know, like you were saying you know get that big boost yep um, yeah, there are some there are some nootropics for which uh, it's it's actually easy to induce that state. Like like there's a nootropic called L-theanine. You can find it in amino. It's an it's an amino acid in green tea, and uh, it's essentially uh, a uh, it essentially induces a, a calm in your brain similar to that of meditation, particularly because it improves alpha brainwave functionality, which is essentially just a, a mode of brain functionality. Uh, that's measured by electrical activity in your brain, and it makes you very calm. And that's where you end up if you sit and meditate for 15 or 20 minutes. L-theanine, this uh, amino, this calming amino acid, 
uh, has been shown to produce that brainwave uh, state in people. So, I mean, so, 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 so while a lot of nootropics are stimulatory and they put you in a place where you're hyper focused or you're able to just like crank out a lot of work, um, you know, there are some that you could take in that case to balance that out to keep you focused and in the moment, like you say. Um, and then, and then there are, and then if you took L-theanine by itself, you would you would sort of just end up in that place where you're not as hyper stimulated and focused on something, but you are in the moment. And because you've got uh, control of your brain and it's calm, you can sort of calmly focus. That might be more along the lines of the flow state that you like to get in. But a lot of the, a lot of nootropics users get into a, you know a fl the flow state for nootropics users. Um, is essentially the capacity to control what's going on, to feel in the moment, but uh, but to not be restricted in any way. If you're if you want to if you want to uh, take off running, if you want to hit the ground running in some area of uh, you know execution in some area of like uh, of cerebral work, then the runway is endless, and you can just you can just do it on cue. Now, when when you say like in terms of your product cortex. Ah. What what is specifically is, is it designed to do in terms of because you were saying that there's specific uh, you know nootropics for focus and there's ones like NRS Tem you were saying it's like it'll give you that creativity boost mm -hmm. when you're in that zone or that, in that situation. Yep. You, my cortex has all these in there, or is it, or is it just a uh, it, uh, focus stack? Well, it, primarily it's a work stack. It's a it's a stack to make you sit down and, and do some work and get it done. For people that have the inability, based on probably neurotransmitter imbalance, to sit down and work for five hours at a time, but they'd really like to to get some stuff done, Cortex will deliver that for you. Uh, for memory functionality, people that like have an issue holding a whole lot of information in their head at once, the the ingredients in Cortex will fix that. Um, so it's it's essentially a focus stack, and it is very stimulatory. But uh, along the lines of the point that I was trying to make with L-theanine, we put another chemical in there called Bacopa Monieri. That's the last one we talked about when Martin asked me what the ingredients were. And Bacopa Monieri uh, is also anti-anxiety. So it essentially attempts to balance the rest of the stack out. It doesn't do so in a real significant way because uh, most of the point of the, at least the course tech stack is to get you in a place where you're very focused and you have the capacity to do a lot of to execute a lot of cerebral work and to some extent calming that down will inhibit your capacity to be productive in that manner but um, but I would so I would say to answer your question in a percentage manner it's probably about 80 percent focus on getting things done and uh, uh, be able to you know, have the capacity to do that and 20 percent uh, inhibiting a little bit of that extra power so that you can do so in a relatively controlled manner. Okay, I just I just have one last point for you. Sure. Because now now I'm, I'm you know my brain's going now. Yeah. And basically I'm, I'm I'm reminded of you know Soylent. You've heard of Soylent? No, uh, Summit. Summit. You mean like a? The Soylent. Soylent. Oh, Soylent. Yeah, I remember reading about that a, a year ago or just a couple years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. right, it's like this liquid stuff that's supposed to have, like, all of the, the yeah. RDA for your vitamins and minerals. Yeah, yeah. got it. Okay, so, so I've, I've taken that. And if you if you go onto the website, you'll see that they have, like, a, like, a, like a forum, in, like a community, basically, where you have all these people creating their, you know, own recipes with the soiling thing. Huh. You know, optimizing and for specific purposes. Like, I, I, I work out. So I'm looking at those saying, oh shit, like like these guys are using solvent for you know in terms of, of protein and and you know the carbs and all these combinations, right? Yeah. So as I'm talking to you and, and understanding you know the shops a little better now, yeah. I'm starting to think how the how in the hell and you you mentioned a keyword in there like biohacker, <laughs> which yeah. Is, you know a big one right now. Right. Uh, what you know how hard is it to for someone like us or you know the common person? to create their own stack of nootropics for specific purposes? Yeah, it's actually a really great question, and that's what a lot of new nootropic users do and current nootropic users do. And I guess the answer to your last question, question is uh, not that hard if you're willing to do the research and the work and you're willing to end the experimentation. You know, If you're willing to source in a bunch of, of different ingredients, uh, read a bunch of tutorials on them, follow nootropics leaders in the community, uh, spend a lot of time on Reddit, the nootropics subreddit, um, yeah, there's a lot of great smart people there, and and then experiment on your own with different quantities of different nootropics and see how they affect you. Uh, then, then, then it's it's fairly easy. Um, and I think a lot of people coming into that scene are very excited about it. 
because of what they hear and learn, and so you know, and so that adds to the motivation to do it. So it, it's not easy because it does require it really does require a degree of scientific uh, sort of functionality in the way that you're approaching yeah. it. Yeah, curiosity, and the way that you're doing it, you know, you have to formulate a hypothesis. You have to engage in a in a thing to confirm or deny that hypothesis. If your hypothesis is wrong, you've got to change what you did, and then you have to try again. Outstanding. Yeah. So oh, this I, is. I, I think I understand it a little better. <laughs> yeah, and it's a complex topic, but you know, it's good that we got together to talk about it so that we can just put out more interest. You know, so that you guys can understand it better. Uh, so uh, you, you, you almost finished off there, George, with something um, come up in conversation I had last week with someone here about maker culture. Um, you talk about biohacking, but I was talking. Uh, I've been involved with some 3D print stuff, but there is there is a there is a rising culture of DIY maker biohacking. Kind of what you're saying, what you were just talking about, fits quite well into that peer-to-peer. Do-it-yourself renaissance of self-experimentation, almost, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah. We, you, you, like I say, we can all hack our own enhancers. In this case, being chemical, um, it's it's kind of decentralized um, anarchy in a sense. Um, right. It's quite fascinating uh, until things go wrong and then the regulations are coming and stuff like that. Yeah. But then right. Kind of the Cambrian explosion of um, new stuff, yeah. new. So it's just a startup kind of culture, yeah. which you're in, of course, isn't it? And yeah. DIY. And of course, with with, with George, you know, with your your series um, that you're you're progressing here, you know, you've, there's a whole lot of biohacking as part of this as well. This being one of them, yeah. um, flow states and mindfulness being others. Then you've got the mechanical um, kind of extremes with people putting on prosthetics and all the rest of it. And then, of course, the implants and the whole lot, you know, it's going to be um, quite fascinating. What, what, um, what my interest in it is, is uh, this era of, um, as we approach robotics and the rise of AI and all this robot apocalypse that's coming, that we're enhancing ourselves, aren't we, to race with the machines and eventually maybe merge with the machines. I don't know. It's, I, I've, got this, I, I've, got, I've got this slide on a talk I do about Eyes Wide Shut. You know that we are marching forwards. Um, mm-hmm. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, it seems. Um, do you know Kevin Kelly's? Uh, is it Kevin Kelly? Um, yeah, Wired magazine. Yeah, is it the Technium? He's got this idea what technology wants, and we just do not seem to be able to stop ourselves forging ahead from the wheel onwards into this, maybe to merge and be replaced by technology, but maybe biohacking. Um, in this manner, maybe humanity's last stand <laughs> as we try to enhance ourselves yeah. before being stuffed out by the robots. And yeah, this is your to- this is your creative thinking coming in. This is your uh, divergent thinking uh, coming in, and so maybe, man. I mean, that's um, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. I never really. I, I, AI to me is is so complex that I haven't even begun to think about it. Uh, but it, you know, I. It, I see what you're saying. Like you're kind of proposing the idea that uh, we're going in the direction technology wants us to go in uh, more and more, and the only way that we can sort of stop that at some capacity or have more control is uh, along the same lines of thinking that biohacking is, which is to uh, granularly control the inputs uh, and functionality of our brain. Granularly control parts, and uh, uh, better we better leave, I suppose, but. You've heard about the attention economy, probably. Um, yeah, I've heard it mentioned before, and I, I don't really know what the concept means, though. It's, it's probably well. It's basically that there's so much information flowing at us that we cannot absorb it all, and we have to, you know, either try to focus on particular parts, or or, or just try and take a generalist approach. And of course, I could see the smart drugs thing fitting in with that because it helps with the attention. That you can then put aside all that distraction and focus on that fire hose of information coming from particular topics on social media, on the net, and in the media, etc. Yeah. Um, but there, there was a there's a debate. I'll digress seriously here. But there, there's, I'm not sure if you're aware of the debate from about two years ago between Nick Carr, um, who who is kind of a, a techno pessimist, I suppose, and he huh. looks at all the 
all the all the the bad stuff that technology is going to do to us. And um, oh, now I should have taken some cognitive enhancers. Uh, That's right. The guy on the other side of the the, the, the debate now um, will come to me after we finished. Actually, of course, of course, of course. Um, but yeah, they're both of them saying that the internet has changed our brains. Yeah. Um, naturally. Nick Carr is saying that it's made us more like more like ADHD sufferers there where we're switching attention. We we don't focus, we don't uh, spend time analyzing things in detail, but we're flitting across. Our attention spans are getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course I can see how these drugs fit in with that because you can pop a pill, not being critical at all, I'm just being observational, yeah. pop a pill and, and then pop a bit of technology to solve the problem technology has created and help us to focus. Mm -hmm. um, damn, I wish I could... Uh, Cherky, Clay Cherky, that's right. Clay, right. Clay Cherky is the guy on the other side, is the media right. professor. Yeah, I'm going um, to make a note so I can check that thing out. Okay. Yeah, um, Clay Shirky and Nick Carr, The Attention Economy, uh, I think... Nick Carr's book was called something like The Internet is Making Us Stupid, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> uh, of course, cognitive smart drugs are the answer to that, aren't they? You know, yeah, they um, might be. Yeah. But I, I'm quite with Clay Shirky's point of view, in fact, that this is part of evolution. Yeah. That on the one hand, you've got people who like to have deep dives, and the typical education system gets more and more specialised and focused the higher you get, if you like. Whereas Clay Shirk is saying there is another skill, which is the generalist skill, which education, it's not seen as smart, it's not measured in that way, but it, it, it deals with the generality of things and linking things together. It's the creative, the old debate again, the, the focus versus the creative, if you like, um, the multidisciplinary approach. And that's, he's saying that, you know, this is a good thing, it's where our minds are adapting to the internet. Mm -hmm. um, they are becoming able to flit across different bits of information and not have to focus. Right. Um, our, 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 our brains are adapting to the new reality of massive amounts of information. So it was just a debate that was going on, Carr versus Shirky. That's about two, three years ago. Yeah. I'll tweet out after this, um, uh, when I look it up, some links that I've yeah. got. Um, but uh, I was just thinking that's where this, for me, that this smart drugs fits in to the evolving debate about technology change and the internet. Yeah, uh, changing and, uh, our brains. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fair point. Uh, that's one of the practical applications for it. A, a lot of the reasons people don't have the capacity to focus uh, is because just what you said, they've been, their brains have been trained to uh, hyper-respond to all these various technological inputs. And so, yeah, point received on this end. Okay. Oh, very, very close. Okay, George. All right, Ryan. Well, when, where can fi people find you? They can find me on the on. Oh, you can hit, you can talk to me on Twitter at r michael ballow. That's my Twitter handle. Uh, the Twitter handle for the for Live Cortex is at Live Cortex, um, and uh, that's essentially it. I have a Facebook account that you can look up. Just look up Ryan Michael Ballow and and hit me up. I really don't keep a whole lot of people connected to me there, but. Uh, but uh, but you're more than welcome to send me a friend request, and we'll see. Um, and uh, that's that's basically it. I spend a lot of time on Twitter, and I respond uh, pretty immediately to people's stuff on Twitter. Cool. And I, I imagine that the website for your product is livecortex.com. <laughs> yep. www.livecortex.com. Keeping it simple. Outstanding. All right, Ryan. Well, thank you so much for uh, you know illuminating us with the uh, information regarding you know nootropics and. Uh, Let's do this again. You know, maybe we can dig deeper on a, you know, the same topic in another angle. That would be uh, great. I yeah. think I think it's very interesting. You know, very interesting topic, and you know, for future to, towards the future, which is what we talk about here is, is at least for me, it's like a, something I'd like to be talking about more. Yeah. You know, with people and sharing it with them because it's, you know, the the whole term of smart drug. I think it, you know shift the perception of what the expectation of what these things are. <laughs> that's exactly right, yeah. That's why it's good to get into some of the details, like, you know, neurotransmitter functionality, how they affect yeah. Earth, how you might be able to use uh, smart drugs and nootropics to uh, negate the negative effects of technology making us want to focus on a bunch of stuff. And so, yeah, I agree. Great room for additional conversations. All right, Ryan. All right. I'll let you guys, you know, enjoy your weekend. Thank cool. You. All right. Let's All see right. you guys. Thank you. See you, Ryan.